Testing. Testing. Hello, can everybody hear me? Great. Guys, everyone, thank you for coming here today. Very excited to have you here. I'm here to introduce Will. He'll be presenting on Weld SO and beyond. Um, it's going to be a great talk, and I'm really looking forward to seeing this come to life. Bye, guys. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, am I? Okay. I feel like I'm audible. If you can't hear me, then cool. All right. I got somebody in the middle. Uh, I want to... Um, I guess I'm going to say I want to thank you in advance. Uh, due to some circumstances beyond my control, these slides are not finished, and um, my luggage arrived right before I got here. So I don't have slides, but I do have clean underwear on. So <laughs> in the end, I think you'll agree that's probably the better choice. Um, so I'm here to talk about Weld.so and beyond. Weld.so is a thing that we kind of made up. Um, so I'm, uh, to give you a little background, uh, I am a uh, so, so I'm, uh, senior software engineer at Red Hat. I've worked on uh, installation and upgrades for 15 years. Um, and uh, so our team has done has a deep history in doing things that involve image construction and packaging um, and the sort of weirder use cases of that. Um, the stuff I'm going to talk about is, is not like super, or it is fairly specific to RPM and the way that we at Red Hat build uh, images and things like that, but I think it, um, the larger lessons sort of apply to the entirety of uh, the Linux ecosystem. So, um, oh yeah, and some quick disclaimers, nothing here, nothing that I say here is like, this is the stuff Red Hat is definitely going to do. Um, if you, a quick show of hands, who in this room works for Red Hat? Okay. For the rest of you, the people who had their hands up, we don't know what number comes after seven. We can't count any higher than that. <laughs> Um, so this has nothing to do with whatever numbers might or might not come after seven. I'm fairly sure there aren't any. Um, and yeah, I, worked, I wrote these like two hours ago. So thank you in advance for bearing with me um, as I sort of ramble at you. So the whole thing I want to say, the, the, the sort of promise of this weld.so thing is that like I'm pretty sure bit looking at the way that we construct uh, images, and by images I mean like file system images like containers or virtual machines or even just like doing an initial install on a system, the way that you do that is like we're using, you know, we're using RPM, we're using packages to do that. And RPM and its friends were designed in the late 90s and they made sense at the time, but there's a lot of slack and stuff getting in its own way that makes everything we do harder than it needs to be. And with some tweaking, we could have a system or a basically a, a um, Linux, a, a model for Linux distributions for going from, you know, upstream projects releasing sources to code that you're running somewhere that was like insanely fast and reliable and just did everything really easily to the point where I'm pretty sure we could start up a, or build a container for every process as it starts up using only the things that it actually needs in its file system. So every process would have its own view of the file system. The same way we do with virtual memory, um, where every process at startup, the dynamic linker goes in and links in the, the uh, libraries that it needs and then actually jumps into your process. We could do the same thing with the file system. And if you think about it, it's kind of weird that we don't do that with the file system. Why is it that every process gets its own private view of memory that the kernel then arbitrates, but we give them all the same view of the disk. It's sort of like it was designed in an era where disks were really slow and there weren't a whole lot of computers and the idea of like doing that was just crazy and they're like, we'll get to it later. If we can do that, if we can build images that quickly, um, milliseconds or less, we can actually do things like OS-wide CI and CD, which has been sort of troubling for Red Hat to do that sort of thing, or in Fedora for that matter, where we can't, we don't do nightly builds of Raw Hat, or we do sometimes, and sometimes we don't. We don't do nightly installer image builds because oh, we do. We try. We try. We try. Ah, <laughs> that's kind of my point. I'd love it if we succeeded. That would be cool. Um, but yeah, so I'm pretty sure that we can just tweak a few things, and I say tweak a few things, but it's actually like a fairly, it's a lot of small system-wide changes that we would need to do to make this sort of a world possible. But it is a lot like the shift from statically linked binaries in the late 80s and early 90s to dynamically linked binaries. And we don't like think too hard about dynamically linked binaries as being like a crazy new thing anymore. But like there was a time where that was new and controversial and people hated it and there were a 
Solaris admins that were like, I will never have dynamically linked binaries on my system ever, you know, fist on the desk. So like, if you're getting, if you're getting a feeling in your chest like this is crazy, this will never work. Why am I, why am I listening to this guy? Like, give me a minute, just like clear your head. So okay, what is Weld and Welder? Just an acronym that we kind of made up for a experimental Linux distribution that we're sort of working on. Like, what's it going to be? The meaning of the acronym changes depending on my mood. I think it was originally Will's experimental Linux distribution. At one point, it was the Wiggum Enterprise Linux distribution because of Ralph Wiggum. Um, and but yeah, we're basically like figuring out new ways to do Linux sister stuff because the way we do it now as I'm saying it's like it's gnarly um, everything is a lot harder than it needs to be and we seem to have a lot we, we spend a lot of time fighting with ourselves building new tools to deal with problems inherent in the system rather than fixing the system itself um, everything like think about how many things features of the RPM ecosystem if you're familiar with it like uh, comps groups um, Every time we need to add something, we add another layer, extra layer of metadata and another extra layer of code to parse that metadata. And at this point, if you're dealing with, I think modules um, involve like, you have to fetch some YAML, which then tells you where to get some, a SQLite database that tells you where to get the XML, no, the XML tells you where the SQLite database is, and then you can start parsing like other, like there's 18 different types of data involved and it's a mess and we could do a lot better. So, I already kind of went through this stuff, but I think that the heart of the whole problem is that we're stuck on RPM. And anybody who has talked to me at all in the past like 10 years is sick of hearing me yell about RPM, and I'm sorry. But um, I, uh, the problem with it is that we have so much of what we do encoded in it that everything we build is built upon it, and we keep building layers and layers on top of it, but nobody understands how it works anymore. Like, nobody actually knows the entire details of how the dependency system works, or what's in the dependency tree, or what the, uh, what's in all of the scriptlets. Um, and they're, like, non-deterministic, and we don't know what they're doing, but we have to run them as root, because they might need a root. So we have, like, this enormous mountain of like code that we can't introspect on, we have no idea what it's doing, and it has to run as root. And that seems like fine to everybody, which kind of makes me cry at night, but that's whatever. Um, for sorry? Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the it's fine part. Well, no, everyone just sort of looks at it and it's like, I guess, I mean, I don't know what we can do about it. And I'm like, I, we could not do that, maybe. Like, just throwing that one out there. Um, and yes, so people are working around the problems. And one of the things that I think is happening with our big shift to containerization is that, and um, or like Go, where Go by default builds statically linked binaries. And it's because of the troubles that we have with dependency resolution and things like that, where you have your Red Hat, or you have your Fedora system or your RHEL system, and you're like, okay, but I, I have this thing that needs these libraries, and I have this thing that needs these other libraries. How do we do that? How do we get two sets of libraries that, oh my god, the package has the same name, but they're different versions. They can't possibly coexist in the same system. I don't know why, they're just files, but okay, RPM says they can't. Um, and so instead of like addressing that problem, we as a community slash industry have been like, what if we just went back to statically linking everything? That was easier. And like, it works better, but it's not a better idea. It just works around that one problem. Um, so the whole thing and the, what I kind of went crazy doing for the past, I'm not going to subject you to it, but we don't really have a good model for how RPM works. Like if you look at the Linux kernel, there is like people have done formal memory models for how the Linux kernel deals with memory and what it does when when it takes locks and all of that stuff to sort of maintain the, the illusion that everything is safe and reliable. Um, it is safe and reliable, asterisk. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as long as you trust your hardware, ha ha. <laughs> um, we don't have anything like that for RPM or packaging in general. Like, we don't have any sets of, like, assertions that, like, okay, a well-behaved build system needs to maintain these sorts of invariants, or, like, we, we can assume that this is true, but we can't assume this is true. So, like, we just sort of make it all up as we go along, and that's where things get weird, like, oh, we can't install two packages with the same name with different versions because reasons. And it's like, okay, well, if we had a model, maybe we could deal with that. So, you know, I have a big, like, crazy model for how, like, written out mathematical model for how you do a Linux distribution, what it actually involves. The pieces aren't that difficult. Um, 
So it turns out if you kind of take it all apart and instead of like, when you build a system using RPM, what you're doing essentially what the installer does, the installer, is, Anaconda, is a mini distribution and you boot a DVD or whatever and it starts this mini distribution and it used to be like a full-fledged mini distribution that had its own like mount binary and a knit system and everything that we had to maintain ourselves and it drove us completely bonkers. So eventually we made it so it's just a small Fedora distribution. It's very, very stripped down that we boot and load into memory and we format your hard drive and then we start installing stuff into it, which is kind of bonkers when you consider that most of what people do after that finishes is they remove all the stuff they didn't want or they make a bunch of changes afterward because we don't know what happens in the middle. It's all mysteries to us. And it's really weird that we take a, we take an empty box and then we like we have these little packages, and people talk about packages like they're bricks, and you just sort of stack them up and you make a wall, but they're more like tiny little robots with like chainsaws and arms on them, and like you dump enough of them into a like little room, and they sort of fight it out for a while, and then they build Voltron, and you're like, cool, <laughs> that's neat. Um, and like we made it all work, and that's amazing, like good job us, but like maybe we could make bricks instead, um, is kind of my whole point. Like I'm gonna come back to this a lot, and I'm gonna use a lot of dumb analogies like that, but my point is that as a community and an industry, we need to start looking at the places where behavior is not introspectable or not deterministic and start stamping them the hell out because they make everything else uh, it, it sort of propagates upward. If you have parts of the lower levels that need to run unknown code as root, well, your upper level either has to work around that or just deal with that maybe happening sometime. And you can only make certain guarantees about what's going to happen in the middle. It's not great. Um, so we sort of did an experiment uh, on our team where we're like, okay, so what if we were doing basically what RPM does to, what the installer does to build systems. So instead of actually doing the thing where we open the box and we throw in all the robots and let them build Voltron, we take all of the pieces and we scra scrape off all of the code from the outside and just make them little bricks and we just put the bricks in place. So just like take the contents of every package, just lay down all of the contents and then not run any of the scriptlets at all. And it works. Like to a first degree approximation, it works. It turns out there are some things that actually do need to be dynamically generated, but they're really well known. Um, I have a different talk about this, um, about what RPM scriptlets actually do. There's only like six things, and it's like create users, um, you know, generate, like it's basically sometimes you generate a file, like you have to, you have a dynamically generated list of users. Okay, fine. Sometimes you do things like you create a host key. Well, you don't always want to do that, right? Like you only want to do that if you're installing on bare metal, if you're making an image for the first time that's going to be a gold master that you're going to replicate everywhere, it does not need that machine specific key. So we need to look at all of that, but that's not what this talk is about. The point is, you can kind of throw it all away and it all still works. Um, so when we did that, we managed to make, we, we built a thing, and this is on our uh, website and it's janky, but we can put together a system about, I think it was, a, um, and Dave, you can confirm this maybe, it's a, a hundred times faster than our current stuff. We can build, yeah, it was, so we, we had an internal team trying to do um, continuous integration stuff uh, on the kernel, and so their whole deal was, you know, build a minimal VM, spin it up, do some stuff with it, or build a minimal system, and then spin it up and do some stuff. It took them about six minutes to build that image, and then they could run their tests, and we could build the equivalent image in six seconds, and that's all I.O. Um, so going back to my, uh, yes, this is basically dynamic linking is what we're doing there at that point. What we're doing is taking, in the same way you do with memory, you're taking an empty a process and you're sort of dumping in the pieces that you need. Um, this is the same thing as dynamic linking in the, and we can just sort of borrow a lot of those ideas and make image construction way easier and way faster. And this is one of the things that ELF got right that RPM gets wrong, um, where RPM is hard to extend. Like, when was the last time? We've added a couple of tags now and then, right? We had weak dependencies after 10 years of fighting about it. Um, we, we, got, we have build requires. I don't think we have test requires yet. Um, yeah, we've been fighting about that one for my entire career at Red Hat. Um, so like, RPM is notoriously hard to extend. Um, it's also, uh, it changes without warning. Like, fun fact, there is a specification for RPM technically in the Linux standard base, um, in that it's a de facto specification. They wrote down how RPM worked at the time. If you implement RPM from that specification, it won't do anything. Uh, we changed how we store file names in RPM headers and uh, didn't even upgrade the, uh, 
increment the version number of the file format. We just kind of like change stuff out from other people all the time without telling them. It's not great. So this is the other thing I'm going to hammer on to us as a community. Um, we need to actually start documenting how stuff works and like commit to not breaking it unless we're going to. Is that ten left? Okay, cool. Uh, not commit to not breaking things um, without at least warning, like incrementing a version number. It's not that hard. RPM, I think, has a 32-bit version number, so like they could do that a couple of times and we'd be fine. Um, but the point here, or the point that this is dynamic linking is an interesting one because there's a whole lot of fun stuff that would happen if we started treating building images like we treat dynamic linking. Um, and I think this is where I run out of slides. Yep. Um, so I can either show you my big outline or I can just hand wave at you, and I might just hand wave. And I apologize for the hand waving, but here we go. So one of the problems that we have with containers is that we ship them around as statically linked blobs. They're kind of not statically linked. There's a bunch of layers to them in the same way that there are layers to uh, st static linked binaries. Um, when you link in stuff, you get, you know, you've got your compression library and all that. So you can build them, and then they're built. And then you don't really know what's in them anymore. And this is why we have things like container scanning. When there is a CVE of some sort, we have to go back and look at all of the stuff that everybody built and figure out which ones have the tainted code and then rebuild all of those. If we were doing it dynamically, where instead you are the image that you build, your container, is like an elf binary. So it's your code and some headers that say, OK, I need this version of this symbol. I need this version of these Python libraries. The same sort of symbols that we're using in RPM as dependencies. Um, with some tweaking, <clears throat> because we want them to be deterministic. Because as it turns out, uh, and I have a talk about this tomorrow, um, I'm pretty sure RPM dependencies are now Turing complete, um, in, and you can uh, use them to run arbitrary calculations, which is not like the best thing that you want out of a dependency system. Uh, it's kind of just like a fun party trick more than it is actually worrisome, but it is like a thing to talk about. But anyway. Point is, if you have a reasonable dependency system like ELFs, you can pull in just the pieces that you need at process startup time. Um, as I understand it, most container runtimes don't share memory um, when they build, or at least with like the thin pool stuff. When you're building, uh, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, when each container has its own block device backing its image, which means that the block device is different for each of them, which means that if you have a thousand containers using a thousand of the same copy of OpenSSL, you have a thousand copies of it in memory and on disk, which is like. Con Sorry? It's not always like that. Okay, good. So there is some improvement, but the last last I heard, it was like that. It was so it was sort of because people were just like, eh, well, you need a block device. So we are i am sort of stumping for a like fairly significant change in how we expect a system to behave we should expect them to behave more like we expect memory to behave like the expectation that you should be able to write to any part of your disk should be like silly cuz like we don't expect you to be able to write to any part of memory that's obviously silly um, the expectation or <clears throat> The expectation that you know you can write to the disk and other processes will be able to read it by default, like that's also kind of silly. Um, we don't always want that. That leads to a lot of fun problems. This is where we get you know uh, temp directory attacks where you have well-known file names and why we have to have temporary directories at all is because there are well-known. If there's a well-known path and you assume that every process sh shares the same file system space, well then you have problems. We could eliminate that entire class of problems. Uh, container like we can eliminate container scanning. We don't need to do that anymore if we're automatically creating stuff as sort of. We can eliminate, uh, yeah, directory name attacks by dynamically creating your file system just for you, so that other people can't actually look at your file system. Um, so that's the the weld.so concept is basically let's look at how um, we put together our dependency chains. Let's try to winnow away all of the parts of RPM that are not deterministic. Um, let's try to make dependencies themselves sane and get to a place where we can just sort of mash the package content all together when we need it and do that to do that effectively back in when dynamic linking was inv invented you needed mmap to make it work right because just actually copying a whole bunch of memory into place that takes a while so then we're like hey we've got mmap mmap if you don't know how that works it's basically you say hey uh, you tell the kernel 
put this library into this memory space. And it goes, cool, OK. Whether or not it's actually in memory yet is not, you don't have to care. Um, the kernel will put it there when it needs it. We could do the same thing with files. Um, we could be doing this rather than when you start up a container, rather than building the entire container right then, we give you an empty namespace. And when you try to look up stuff, then we start putting stuff into it. In fact, we already have the capability to do this in the kernel. It's just bind mounts. So we need to do some stuff with rearranging paths um, to make this work. But instead of actually you know, decompressing a whole bunch of RPMs and copying all their contents in, you could just bind mount the contents of each thing that you need into your private space for your process. This should take milliseconds. It's gonna. It requires us to do some janky stuff with like um, where you look uh, the the paths that you look for libraries, but we can do that. Um, we we have control over the entire system. We know how to do all of these things. So, oh, and went away. So the point that I'm making here, broadly, is that all of the things that we need to do to build a system where everything is reliable and deterministic and shared in a way that isn't like it is now. Like, we have control over all of it. We could just do this. I just need people to, like, buy in on the idea of making a somewhat radical shift in how we put things together. And I don't know that that meets with a lot of resistance. Most of the time, what I get is what I call the MacGyver problem, which is sort of like this. If you've ever watched MacGyver, you go back, like MacGyver's, you know, super dude, he like will fix things with bubble gum and duct tape and like saves the day with ingenuity and using things in unpredictable ways. Well, so a lot of times if you go back and watch an episode of MacGyver, um, the entire thing hinges on him like, on like somebody needs to get a piece of information to somebody else or else like the ambassador is going to explode or whatever it is, right? Like, I don't know why, but like you have to tell the ambassador not to say what, whatever it is. But like if you have cell phones, the entire plot just falls apart, right? You just like, hey, ambassador, don't do that. Okay, done, episode over. Nobody needs MacGyver. So like the problem is if I show up in an episode of MacGyver and everyone's like, what are we going to do? The ambassador is going to explode. And I'm like, just call him on a cell phone. Everyone's going to look at me like, what? And I'll be like, okay, well, all right, so all you need to do, right, is build a worldwide network of radio towers and then invent pocket supercomputers and teach them to talk to the radio towers. And then you can just call him on his pocket supercomputer. And they're like, we're going to go with MacGyver's plan because that's going to keep the ambassador from exploding now. And it doesn't mean that, like, building this network is a bad idea, but it means that it doesn't solve the problems that people are immediately facing. And I think this is the other thing that we as a community and an industry have been doing is MacGyvering the hell out for years and not really looking at the larger problem of what it is we're trying to accomplish. And like the larger thing about what we're trying to accomplish when we do image creation and what we're doing with containers is that we're trying to sort of extend what we do with memory already to the disk because we have a lot of stuff like interpreted languages like Python that want to, in the same way that C does, where it's like, okay, I, I might need this library, so make sure it's available for me. And the kernel will put it in your memory space if it needs it. We could do the same thing with the file system. It just makes sense to do it that way. But there's, that doesn't, it's the MacGyver problem. Like, it makes sense to do it that way, but it would require systemic changes to everything we do. Not huge changes, little changes, but it requires, like, system-wide changes. And, like, you know, I can do parts of this, like how you store everything on disk, right? You want to do it sort of OS tree style in a content addressable store so you get automatic deduplication so it's efficient and all of that good stuff. We have all of the pieces that we want to build this sort of a system. We haven't put them all together yet. And really, it's just about getting everybody to get the idea in their head of what it is we're trying to build and then start building toward it. Um, so that's sort of what this is going to be about. It was going to have a lot more slides. Um, and the weld.so thing is basically, once we get to that point, once we have made these changes, we could have a system where you, your, your program, your thing, maybe it has an ELF header on it, and it actually calls out to weld.so, which then you know, dynamically constructs an entire file system for your thing, and then dynamically constructs memory space, and then it runs. Like, we can build all of this. All of the pieces are already there. Um, and that's about all I wanted to say, I think. Um, we're about time. So yeah, um, are there any questions about any of this? Or do you just want to hear me rant about RPM more? Because I can do that all day.
So is there anyone doing this today? Any of the other distributions? Any other OSs? No. As far as I can tell, no. Um, and I have a theory on this, but um, no, I've asked around to anybody uh, to wh wherever I could find it. And there are pieces of it. Um, I've seen parts of like the uh, making building of packages more deterministic. You see a lot of that in NixOS. Um, and like doing uh, atomic updating and, and uh, quick generation of images you see from OS tree, um, but they're still sort of constrained by RPM or their current system. And so the, it takes a large, like it takes a um, industry-wide effort essentially, which is how ELF got implemented in the first place in dynamic linking was that, you know, the industry was a lot smaller then and you could kind of throw stuff around a lot more easily. And there aren't a whole lot of people, uh, companies making operating systems left. And so, there's a lot of MacGyvering and not a lot of like, hey, we should all work together to do this massive system-wide change for the good of the industry. Um, containers sort of showed up because they scratched an itch, but I haven't seen any, uh, I haven't seen the larger effort to attack the larger problem that I'm trying to describe. Um, and I'm sorry, I should have repeated with the question. The question was, is anybody working on this yet? Um, and yeah, I've asked around and I haven't seen it yet. Have you, uh, have you like, given any thought to what a migration path would look like? I mean, hy hypothetically, you get all this working, and you say, yeah. let's, like, get from here to there, because it yeah. sounds kind of disruptive. Yeah, um, and that's that's a big, that's a big one. Um, and I think the way that we do that is not as hard as we might think in that uh, a well-designed a well-designed system that you know adheres to a good you know model of how we want uh, distribution to work um, would by sort of default like eliminating some of the gnarlier parts of what we have now it would be compatible with it um, in the abstract so like what what we did with our experimental um, image builder was we just imported rpms we strip out the parts that would not be allowed in our system but we just import content directly from rpms and um, i think we also extended it to work with npm modules is that right okay okay yeah so yeah um the the idea is that you can any any model that is sufficient to make this work is also sufficient to, or you can probably f wedge existing things into it. Um, and so the plan is to sort of bit by bit uh, look at how the whole system works. Um, Linux distributions are a loop, basically, right? You have sources, and then you make builds, and you put a bunch of builds together to get an image. And then the trick is, oh, when you did that build of a, when you did that build, that was inside a build environment, which is an image. So you've got this loop going of source to build to images thing. So you can take pieces of that loop and replace them one at a time with something that takes the same inputs and has the same outputs, but maybe is different in the middle. And then you can start cutting out pieces, like um, <clears throat> spec files, for instance. Oh boy, spec files. There's like four different Turing complete languages fighting for dominance in there, and it's horrifying. Um, but if you had something that was, you know, data that you could compile into a spec file, well, now you've got something else that you can write that's a little more reasonable, and we can still plug it into our existing stuff. And then, well, wait, what if instead of doing an RPM build and then putting the RPM content into our weird content store, why don't we just build straight from this thing into the content store, and we're hopping over RPM at that point. So I, I, part of it is looking at the bigger model, identifying each piece of the system, and figuring out which ones we can most easily replace with something that's compatible but, but better, um, which I know is an abstract hand wavy out answer, but I hope that makes sense. It seems feasible. All right, cool. Yeah. Yeah. You, you may actually have touched on my question already, which was that um, I've First, I want to say, great, you've said it way better than I've been ranting for the last 15 years, too. Hooray. Um, it, in working also with container builds, there, we're, we're doing this thing most of the time where we're building RPMs and then running yum inside containers, which I need air sick bags. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. But one of the things in looking at, at maybe ways to address that specifically was to take the RPM system and break it in half and say, all right, here's a build piece which creates artifacts. And then we take them and we put them into an RPM or we put them into a, a container image. You may have more sophisticated yeah, yeah. ways of thinking about that, but that seemed to me to be a, a relatively simple way of reusing one bit 
But then I yeah. got to your then I got to your point of RPMs. No one knows how they work, so tearing right, them apart right. is hard. But sure, we want, but we do want to maintain backwards compatibility. Um, so it's not so bad to be like uh, I think you're. I think that's the right uh, instinct there is to say, all right, we're going to have something that could do a, do things a new way, but also builds the old way if you want it to. Um, we didn't get as far back in the sort of process as looking at um, the the spec side of it. I mean, I have you know obviously big hand weavy ideas about it, um, but. But uh, that wasn't what we originally started attacking. We started attacking sort of RPM as a storage medium um, and the dependency resolution and image construction start part of it. I'm concerned with provenance. Yeah, exactly. And yes, I also have concerns with that. And yes, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> The, the the efficiency in the um, uh, is mind boggling in containers, and it's a good solution. But lots, you know, we just keep getting more memory, faster computers, bigger. You know. um, it sounded like there was a good security viewpoint from yours. That seems like a maybe the biggest selling point, if that's the right direction. Yeah, it, it depends on who I'm talking to, but yeah, there's some interesting stuff about that. I mean, if you think about all of the memory protection that we've added uh, in ELF over the years, right? Like, you could do an equivalent to address space uh, layout randomization, file system layout randomization, where uh, you have marked in your in your container every place where you call, say, bin bash. And just like we do when you start up an ELF process, we go through and relocate all of those. So instead of being bin bash, it's some randomized path. And when we link in bin bash into your image, we put it at that randomized path. So even you don't know where bin bash is. So like your attacker can never run a shell because they don't know where it is, and you don't know where it is. Um, all of the protections that we have for memory, we can apply equally to the file system, which is really interesting when you talk about interpreted languages that need the file system to get their libraries. Um, it's sort of a wonder we didn't do it before in, from, a, from my point of view, but uh, yeah, I think for a certain crowd of folks, that's a very interesting... I have a friend who works for the DoD who is very interested in this very problem. So yeah, I think that's um, something worth exploring further. Um, and yeah, I... Again, uh, this is a general thing. Um, any ideas that this makes you have about what you could do with a system like this, um, I'd love to hear because I know the parts that I care about, having done like installs and upgrades for like way too many years. But I want to hear about the other stuff. Like I have vague notions about security things, but I don't know what specific classes of problems it would eliminate for your stuff. So please come talk to me. Let's figure this stuff out. Um, anything else? Do we have time for one last question? So yeah, you brought up Bash, and actually this is where I'm trying to wrap my head around this. So if all processes only had access to, I guess, the files that they sort of owned, sort of how memory does, how would like an interactive Bash shell work? Um, like I teach an intro like the command line course, right? And so they learn about CD and all that kind of stuff. So how would something like that exist in the environment you're thinking of? Um, in what sense? Like how would the, what part of that would be tricky? I, well, I mean, would, that, would you, sorry, would you get a bash I mean, shell that could go to wherever in the directory hierarchy that wanted? Oh, um, well, so your your bash process is going to have its own memory view. So, yeah, you're going to want to have, like we do with the sort of file system containers, like there isn't, you're going to need a set of tools, and this is what I'm alluding to, you're going to need a set of tools that look at these sort of, your system is going to have a root content store. Um, that contains all of the possible packages that everything on your system is going to need. You're going to want something that's your sort of hypervisor, login, whatever, a standard workstation type shell. And that one's going to have bin bash in there in the normal place. Your usual, this is how you log in. So like that, that contained image is going to be a standard whatever. But all of your other ones can be funkier if they want to. Um, so when you log into your your shoe that your shell sort of defines as what things should be in its file system, um, but it's not going to get everything for everybody on the system, right? Like if you don't use PHP at the command line, you're not going to have PHP in there. There's going to be another set of tools that you use to look at the uh, global, or not global, but your system's content store to say, oh, okay, I do have this copy of PHP here, um, or whatever. Universal application, universal application of PHP. 
Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Or like it's a Git or a Git style content store, where it's just content. You you have a package, and your packages are all in some big heap. And when you start a process, you pull the right ones out of the heap and you run them. And your login can be in that heap, but it's not going to have everything in the heap unless you really want it to. But why would you do that? And there's collisions and stuff. You can't really do that. But anyway, um, yeah. No, that's a, it, it is an interesting point because it sort of disrupts the idea of logging into the system because there isn't a the system. There is each thing gets its own view of the larger whole of the components that are used by all of them. But there isn't one canonical thing that, uh, unless you're directly looking at the store itself. Um, did that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. And I guess that's all I've got time for. Thank you all very much. Um, I really appreciate it. <laughs>